Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're going against the spread on this Sweet 16 March Madness weekend of basketball. I can't believe it, guys. The March Madness tournament is down to the Sweet 16. Next week, we're going to be talking about the championship game, the Final Four and the championship game. It has absolutely flown past us here, but nonetheless, we are into Sweet 16. We're going to break the Sweet 16 round down uh, along with all of our panelists here, our host, our co-host, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, the legend, the living legend, I should say himself, from Las Vegas, Jim Feist, our good friend Tony Mejia, a playbook experts, and our co-host producer, Greg DePalma from Prime Sports Network. And uh, just a quick note here, guys, that uh, we were going to hit a little bit on the new rule change that occurred in the National Football League about the kickoffs, and it's going to be quite controversial to say the least. And in fact, we're going to do a special segment video about the kickoff, so Check out your YouTube channel, your Playbook Experts YouTube channel, and look for that video about the NFL football kickoff rule. Andy, I know you had a quick thought on that before we get into the March Madness. First thought that came into mind is obviously the league wants more kickoff returns. I think they said there was an average of like 2.2 per game last year, which is uh, historically low. My first thought was... We're going to see higher games, higher scoring games, because you're going to get better field position with the way the new rules come into effect that instead of getting the ball at the 20 or the 30 in certain cases, you're going to be able to get guys return the ball closer to midfield. And I think that that's going to, by its very nature, increase scoring. So well, yeah, hopefully yeah. it'll take a while for the lines maker to catch up. But the initial thought is, and especially because preseason games tend to be lower scoring. So we may not see that much of an impact. So maybe like week one and week two, there might be some value in going over some of those those uh, first two week totals. So the question to you, Jim Feist, is uh, are you prepared to play an over 76 on an NFL football game? <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit higher of an adjustment than I would expect. That, that, okay. that, that's, that's, a, that's quite the boost. I we know. might see 56s okay, instead there, of possibly seeing 52s or 51s. I'd probably just take all the under 76 all season. There you go. I think you would. You make a living, a living doing that. I'm sure you would. Uh, you'd end up going something like 240 and 30. 240 <laughs> wins and 30 losses. All right, guys. Let's move it over to the March Madness Sweet 16 round this weekend here. And uh, uh, what we're going to talk about here is basically about how these teams got here. Uh, any surprises that we saw in the Sweet 16 round? And we'll be tearing it down a little bit further uh, as we go on into the show here. I'm going to start off, first of all, with our co-host, Greg De Palma our producer from Prime Sports Network. And Greg, I want to ask you this question. Is there anything that happened that led us to the Sweet 16 uh, March Madness weekend this weekend that caught you by surprise? Yeah, the lack of upsets. Uh, there were a few upsets, obviously, on uh, Thursday and Friday, but I don't even know. We had maybe one uh, legitimate upset on Saturday or Sunday. It's just amazing. All the one seeds, all the two seeds. I mean, there's basically just like one seeded team per region that wasn't supposed to be here. That's just, I don't think I've ever seen it before like this. Now, maybe we'll get upsets in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, I, but it's starting to now get to a point where, remember we were kind of joking last week um, that uh, uh, Jim was taking uh, chalk and because it doesn't happen very often. Well, chalk looks like it's uh, it's maybe the the, the 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 moniker for this year's tournament. Um, and and I've already started to think that way. Is that even though I, all four of my picks from last week are still in it, I, I'm starting to think. Well, maybe the one and two seeds might end up you know dominating the final four now. Tony, let me ask you this. So if it is chalk, and we're seeing a lot of it, we're seeing a lot of very very high seeded teams. In fact, only one double did you see that's reaching this round so far. Does the tournament, the Sweet 16, warrant being called the Pepto Bismol Sweet 16? Well, it's, it's fantastic for the matchups in, in, on Thursday and Friday and then the, the Elite Eight. It truly really is. But it just it goes to show you that the little guy's up against it even more now because we see these teams fortified by transfers that have come from these Cinderella's. I mean, Dalton Connect, he wouldn't have stayed at Northern Colorado because he was a grad transfer, but that's the kind of player that takes Tennessee to another level. So they would all, all ordinarily be on, uh, you know, spearheading in Oakland. Uh, but now they're trying to stop you from getting that upset. And I think we'll continue to see that going forward. And especially you see these guys now uh, already hitting the portal. They did it starting Monday, um, you know, in search of better NLI deals, 
you had uh, you know, the, the Michi Johnson, the leading scorer at South Carolina. He wants to test the market. That's just the, the, the climate now. So we'll we'll continue to see this where higher uh, higher seeded teams will be tougher to upset. Uh, but you know, to answer your question, yes, it's going to produce um, you know tremendous matchups in the round of 16. We've got a well, a one and a half point spread in, in Iowa State and Illinois as uh, as the uh, best lowest spread on on Thursday. And we've got some really nice matchups. Like I said, I think only one one double digit favorite, and I think that's UConn. So um, should be fun. Uh, Jim Feist, let me ask you this question. Uh, every year at this time, the Sweet 16, uh, a favorite exercise that I have, and I've done this for 20-plus years, 30-plus years, is breaking down how the teams performed in the tournament to get to this stage, to the Sweet 16 round. And a real, by simple math, basically adding up how many points they've scored the first two rounds, how many points they've allowed uh, along the way, uh, it'll really kind of open your eyes a little bit to who's playing what and how they're playing a style of basketball. And uh, I mentioned it being very chalky, and I know that's not uh, your cup of tea. Uh, defense usually prevails moving forward from this point out, from the Sweet 16 run out, because the better you are defensively, the better you're prepared to win basketball games. Do you foresee defense making a play in the Sweet 16 round? Well, of course. Um, these, these are the best 16 teams. So you're going to have, A, you should have some pretty decent coaching, Florida leadership, inside play, being able to play um, different styles of offense and defense, and the coaches can make those changes that you know instantly. Um, these are the best teams. I mean, that's why they're here. Now, granted, you know Baylor goes down to Clemson and all that, but they're still. I mean, look at look at this. I mean, we didn't. Nobody predicted that the ACC and the Big East would have these massively good records in this tournament. I mean, nobody could see that coming. Everybody thought it would probably be the Pac-12, or the, excuse me, the Big 12, and they haven't performed anywhere near that, and the SEC hasn't performed anywhere near the ACC or the, the Big East. So, yeah, you're going to see some – I mean, we don't really have any big – we don't have a double-digit favorite across the board in any of these games. I mean, Connecticut – you know, is nine and a half, ten, ten and a half, or, but you can shop that number either side. Everything else is is reasonable. I mean, yeah, you have uh, Marquette at seven and a half, but they're also sixes and six and a half. So there's lots of different numbers out there, but there's no massive. We don't have what we had in the beginning. These are these are more competitive teams, more competitive coaches, and uh, they're solid. Well, you, you know what uh, surprised me before I turn this over to Andy here is uh, in that uh, going down that stretch that I was talking about defense at this Sweet 16 stage of the tournament here, which team of the Sweet 16 teams do you guess is leading all 16 teams in scoring this tournament so far? It's the, it's the team that averaged only 74 points a game during the regular season and couldn't find a bucket and was perceived to be the weakest offense coming in. Oh, That's Houston. Exactly right. The Houston Cougars, exactly. Uh, uh, and there's only other, two other teams that have allowed more points in this tournament than has Houston, who's defensively, defensively staunch or supposed to be. But uh, the, they're the third worst defense in points allowed so far, Houston is. So it's an atypical tournament, if you will, for the Houston Cougars. Alabama and Marquette, the other two weak link defensive type basketball teams. Uh, Andy, uh, we hit on before about uh, Jim did about the success of the Big East and the uh, uh, and the Big East and the uh, ACC so far combined collectively fourteen and one in the tournament. What do you see these two teams doing? Are they targeted right now, Andy, or are they just playing some flat out good basketball? I, I think it's uh, they're playing very good basketball. I mean, you take a look at Virginia and what they did in the play-in game. You say, gee, if that's an idea of what we're going to get out of the ACC, uh, they're not going to be long for the tournament. Well, what do they do? They go 4-0 and in the opening round and 4-0 and in the round of 32, as you uh, pointed out, to uh, get to uh, uh, their record of 8-1, and and that includes the Virginia loss in the Big East, 3-3, three 6-0. Three, and oh. Now, I did a little exercise as far as the overall seeding because we want to know how, how formful this is in the three- well, this is now the fourth season since the COVID uh, cancellation of the tournament. 
If you add up the seed numbers of the teams that made the Sweet 16 in 2021, they added up to 94. If you in 2022, they added up to 85. Last year, they added up to 78. So we've seen a downward trend. This year, it went from 78 to 53. Wow. So that's that's a remarkable. Now, uh, as Greg mentioned, the teams that were expected to be there, you know, basically they all made it. But that also include, you know, you're including the number four seed. I'll put the number four and number five seeds together because you've also got two number five seeds, which easily could have beaten four seeds and been considered as teams that likely or with good possibilities of making it there. So really, you take a look at the teams other than uh, seeds one through five. You've got Clemson as a number six seed and NC State as a number 11 seed. So it's a very formful tournament, which I think because of what it indicates, and we sort of talked about it before we went on the air and, and Tony alluded to it, the transfer portal has resulted in players going from the lesser teams and signing with the better team. So that overall, there's been a, a widening talent gap for the most part between the halves and and I won't say have nots, but they have lessers. And so we've seen that at play. And that leads me to think that we will see upsets in the round of the Sweet 16 and maybe well into the Elite Eight because of the fact that there's been uh, a weeding out of all the teams that don't have the talent of the teams that ended up succeeding. Even It's interesting because we've got a couple of things here. Uh, Purdue is trying to do what Virginia did a few years ago, go from losing to a, as a number one seed to a 16 and then coming back and winning the tournament next year. Well, that's what Purdue is in this year. At the same time, North Carolina State is looking to do what UConn did a decade or so ago, and that is winning five games in five nights to win their conference tournament and then going on that same year to win the entire tournament. Then, of course, you have UConn, who was one of those teams that I just mentioned that NC State's trying to emulate, and they're in the tournament themselves. And I'd have to say, based upon what we've seen the first weekend, the three teams that have performed the best, and of course, you got to consider the level of competition, but who's playing better than Purdue, uh, uh, UConn, and I'll throw Gonzaga in there, even though they beat a depleted uh, Kansas team, but they've played extremely well. I'm looking forward to that Purdue-Gonzaga matchup this week because I would not be surprised if the winner of that game makes the Final Four and even if they face Connecticut, wins it all. You mentioned Gonzaga. This is, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I think their eighth straight Sweet ninth. 16. Ninth. Ninth straight Sweet 16 appearance here. And, you know, we're talking about a team that's not coming from a major conference, uh, you know, considered a, a mid-major, if you will, although they're a giant in the eyes of the a big dance in the Sweet 16. But uh, I think it's one of the best jobs Mark Few has done with his basketball team in his career there, just getting into the Sweet 16 no. in the manner in which he's gotten them there so far. One thing I'm going to throw out here, guys, is we've got a rarity here in the, in the Sweet 16 round here, and it's that we have all four number one seeds that are here, and only one time have all four number one seeds advanced to the Elite Eight round in the last 13 tournaments. Which of the number one seeds do you guys feel is most vulnerable to not make it to the Elite Eight round? I'll throw that out to you, Jim, first. Which of, the, of these number one seeds do you think is most likely to get tripped up, tripped up this week? Arizona. Well, but since they're a number two. Well, you know, yes. Yeah. But um, of the ones, uh, not Connecticut. I don't think anybody matches well with Connecticut. So I, I, I'd be surprised if they go down. Um, hmm. Well, we got. Uh, North Carolina, yeah. Purdue, and Houston. Right. The other three. Houston. The Houston Cougars. One vote for the Houston Cougars. Greg, who do you think of the number one seeds does not make it to the Elite Eight round? Yeah, uh, I agree. It's Houston. I've got, uh, I think Duke now, uh, they, they just murdered James Madison. I was really impressed by them. Houston, pretty fortunate to be here. Uh, that was some uh, end of regulation game against Texas A&M. But they showed some guts to get uh, past Texas A&M in overtime. Uh, but, yeah, I just like the way Duke's playing right now. So I'd have to say uh, Duke. And, by the way, if you uh, did not get an opportunity to purchase the the playbook March Madness uh, extravaganza newsletter last week, what stuck with me was uh, some, uh, a, 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 a coaching stat with Mark Few. Do you remember that one, Mark, the one about Mark Few and number one seeds? Uh, he's never beat a number one seed, right? Yes, and I believe yeah. he's also like one in seven against his spread, maybe, 
Yes, so he's like zero and eight and one and seven, something like that. Right. So that that stuck with that definitely stuck with me. And uh, they also lost to Purdue earlier this year, and I believe last year as well. Yeah. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I've got two Houston's here so far. Tony, who do you see number one seed? Looks to be most vulnerable. Most vulnerable to me is North Carolina because out of the other th- uh, three number one seeds, they all have somewhat of a, a, of a geographical advantage. North Carolina has absolutely none. They're out in L.A. So Alabama can, you know, Roll Tide fans will be out there. Tar Heel fans will be out there. And the Encore uh, product, I think it's going to be one of those things where, uh, and uh, just as an aside, there's a, there's a prop on FanDuel. What will be the most lopsided result of the day one Sweet 16 games? And I gave out, obviously, UConn, San Diego State, um, as, as, but it's still at plus money at plus 150, and it's at plus money because you can kind of see that Purdue Gonzaga could end up being a, uh, a, a lopsided result. I don't really think Illinois and Iowa State will be, but then you've got this North Carolina Alabama game. Given the pace that Alabama wants to play at, if they shoot poorly, North Carolina can blow them out. If they shoot the lights out and the Tar Heels struggle, you know, they can't get uh, RJ Davis going, they can get blown out. So I think from that standpoint, uh, Carolina is the most vulnerable. You know, they, they, they've been solid. There's no question about that. Alabama had to uh, survive that funky game against Grand Canyon. But uh, certainly when Mark Sears is right uh, they, and Estrada gets it going, they can beat anybody, especially if they're, they're flammable from beyond the arc. You know, you mentioned North Carolina, and we call this out in our Sweet 16 tournament guide this week. And uh, you have to wonder if Hubert Davis doesn't tell his team that we've got a major problem here guys that uh you look in las vegas uh they like arizona better than they like us uh, at the superbook arizona's a shorter odds to win this tournament than is number one seed north carolina arizona number two seed so it's vegas speaking up and saying that they are the better team arizona rather than north carolina andy i've got two houston's and one north carolina what's your vote i'm going with houston as well uh, when I, uh, one of the exercises I do before the tournament, and I sort of do it throughout the, uh, the various rounds, is there are 15 factors that I look at and I assign weighted values to each of them. I was surprised that when I did it, uh, Duke came out better than Houston as far as the overall weighting goes. And it had to do not, well, a lot, largely with Duke's balance, but also some of the significant deficiencies on the part of. Uh, uh, Houston. Uh, number one, their free throw percentage, I think, is uh, the worst of the 68 teams uh, in the field. And that becomes critical in close late game situations. And they also are very are very poor at, th- at three point shooting offensively. They have one of the lower rates uh, in the in the field as well. And that could hurt them if they're forced to play from behind and take threes, especially, let's say, when you get to the 10 minute mark of the second half. And let's say Duke is up by six to eight points for whatever reason, uh, it becomes more pressure on du- on, uh, uh, on, uh, on Houston to not let that lead get away, and they may be a little bit more undisciplined than you would like them to be. So I think uh, Houston is the most vulnerable of the uh, of four. I'd probably say, I guess you'd have to say Connecticut is probably the least vulnerable. And I was a skeptic of Purdue coming into the tournament. I said, give me three games to give my uh, impression about Purdue. Are they the same Purdue as uh, last year? Well, they passed the first two games with flying colors. So I would have to say uh, that I'd, I'd say Purdue second most vul- uh, third most vulnerable, second most vulnerable would be North Carolina. But then again, I take a look at the results in the regular season when I'm taking talking a look at Duke's chances of beating um, Houston and North Carolina's chances against Alabama, you can make the point that, well, North Carolina beat Duke three times this year. Well, we've got three Houstons, one North Carolina, and uh, I'll make it uh, four to one for Houston. I agree uh, with the Cougars being most vulnerable here as well. One thing I'm seeing is uh, something that's a little bit atypical out of them is they're not playing Houston Cougar basketball. Uh, As I alluded to earlier here, all of a sudden they become an offensive basketball team. Their defense, which has been their staple, has sort of been left in the locker room. And uh, they just coincidentally happen to be taking on a Duke basketball team who is allowed the fewest points in this tournament so far. So unless Houston straps on the defense against Duke and goes back to their style of basketball, you know, an upset here might not surprise me at all either here. By, by the way, Mark, 
when you did your scoring analysis, did you factor in the overtime, the 14 points that Houston scored in overtime, or did you eliminate that and just say through 40 minutes and Houston still comes out as number one? I, I didn't I didn't buy overtime insurance, Andy, no. <laughs> <laughs> No. I don't know how much I of a difference it would would be tough, though. I mean, they, they beat, they beat uh, Longwood by 40, and they looked like Houston against Longwood. I, I didn't touch that uh, that A&M game. They, they met each other earlier in the season. You knew that A&M's guards would bring it. A&M looked tremendous in, in mowing down Nebraska in, in the opener. So, to me, I, I mean, like, look, I, I'm expecting Houston to look like Houston against Duke. But Duke was impressive against James Madison. This will be by far, though, the best defense that the Blue Devils will have run into in quite some time because nobody nobody defends in the ACC except Virginia, uh, who, who doesn't score at all uh, out the way that Houston does. Well, you, do, you do the math. You're not getting defensive because Houston's my national championship or anything. That would make, for, by the way, for an interesting prop bet. How many of the Sweet 16 uh, teams will score more in the first half than Virginia did in their opening first in loss. <laughs> All of them. I, I think I think they scored four, what did they score forty seven in that loss or something like that. It, I sort of think the answer that really wants to sweep Virginia under the carpet and maybe uh, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah forty two. Forty two. So how many how many teams in the Sweet Sixteen will score more than forty two points? First you know. half. You know, that <laughs> that's a good question. You know, you that's why it'd be, that's why it would be a nicely priced prop too. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, could, I, I, I agree with Tony. All of them. <laughs> San Diego State against Connecticut. Yeah, maybe not all of them, but I, I could definitely see that that both North Carolina and Alabama doing it. Clemson, Clemson, if PJ Hall stays out of foul trouble against Arizona, that could be a high scoring first half. I, I think we'll, we'll probably end up seeing more high-scoring first halves and then things settling down in second halves. I would we'll, say we'll, an interesting number might be 11 and a half. 11 and a half uh, uh, of the teams? Yeah, in the first maybe. half. 11 and a half of the 16? Yeah. 12, you need 12 to score more than 42 and only four to stay under. I, I, I would I'd probably go a little lower than that, maybe nine and a half, just because 42 is a, is a pretty high number for, for college. But I mean, no, I, I was joking earlier, but you could, you'll definitely see more than half this this, this group uh, probably end up in the 40s. I guess you could take a look at it by projecting, and I haven't done it, projecting based upon the point spread and the line, uh, what you would expect it to be, and say maybe what about 45 percent of the total points in the game scored in the first half and 55 in the second half. Yeah, projected team totals. And oh, yeah, maybe your nine and a half is a better number. I mentioned Duke guys being the uh, the stingiest team so far in the tournament, uh, allowing only 51 points a game. Right behind them is Tennessee. Surprisingly, uh, they play some pretty good defense. Have the fouls. I don't think that was expected from them. Uh, and then followed uh, next defensively in order, UConn playing some really good basketball, allowing just 55 points a game uh, in this tournament. Uh, so, like you mentioned, Andy here, did I include the overtime in the scoring? No, I did not. But, you know, when you're talking about defense, you don't have to worry about what you're including overtime is when it's defense is defense. And uh, I'm sort of maybe overhitting on, uh, on this subject. Only because I was here. thinking that Purdue scored, what, the 108 or 109 or Alabama did in one of their games. A couple of those teams scored over 100 and how that would have affected you know, uh, compared to Houston, who got 14 additional points, and according to that, Houston would still be probably top two or three at worst. Yeah, well, if you took out the overtime points, you're talking Alabama. You're talking obviously high offense and lousy defense, which yeah. isn't a good combination, I don't think. That's what makes stadium. that matchup against Carolina very intriguing. Yes, it does. So, Jim, let me ask you this: We're talking about scoring and totals and everything, uh, and you'll find a matchup: uh, Alabama, North Carolina. And you have the highest total on the on the card here this weekend. Are you looking for value in a game like that? Or are you looking to make a case to go under because of the high total in a game like that? You know, I haven't I haven't played very many totals in in the in the tournament. Uh, been more fo focused on the sides, and I was doing okay until we hit the fifteen and one favorites covering or winning all their games, except the one but uh, Baylor not winning. So it was a rough weekend sidewise for me because I am more of an underdog player. However, when I get to the Sweet 16 and I feel we have we have some quality teams here. At least 14 of these teams are, are really pretty damn good. Um, and I don't see that there's a lot of upsets to worry about. I think these teams are pretty damn equal 
And when you when you have teams that depend so much on the three point shot, and you get a team that's a, that's hitting thirty eight to forty percent in in the regular season, they come up out and uh, and hit two out of twenty, or somewhere in the ten to fifteen percent range. It's the most fickle stat, and we look at it because we have to. But it's hard to predict who's going to come out and shoot like that. Some of these guys, when we had the one team to win, they hit two out of 20 and won the game. Well, let me ask you guys this here. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Greg. Uh, as you are going to begin to wrap up the show, this would be a little bit of a shorter show. Obviously, it's only Sweet 16, not the big tournament. Uh, but uh, coming into this, uh, into this tournament here, we had a, a lot of legends and lores with uh, Tom Izzo being a coach and, you know, who's been known to make a lot of noise. Bill Self from Kansas, who self-destructed. Uh, that's probably a good name for his last name, self-destructed, uh, or his team did anyway. Uh, are there any coaches here right now, and I'll leave this open to anybody here. Greg, you can jump in if you like. Any coaches here that are about to put themselves on the coaching map? Uh not so much a, a legendary coaching map, but coaches that are here now in the uh, Sweet 16 round that are going to end up becoming a name that you want to obviously consider moving forward in future NCAA tournaments. Well, well Otsenberg Ot from, from Iowa State is up for National Coach of the Year. I think he's the, he's the, the big unknown. And he obviously coached at UNLV, so people know him uh, in Vegas. But yeah, nationally, I think. I think he's uh, he's the guy. I think that um, if San Diego State does what I predicted last week, so I'm still I still have hope after the way I San Diego State's played the first two games that they can upset UConn. Um, I think Butcher's a guy that's going to have to get respect. Um, you, know, you can make anybody can make a run to the Final Four, but if he can beat UConn after making a run to the Final Four and then get to the Elite Eight, boy, that's somebody that uh, you want to keep an eye on. Uh, for sure. And then uh, Keats at NC State. Um, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been easy for him there, but uh, they're, they're making uh, a lot of noise. And I, and I, and I expect that the noise is going to continue. So, you know, he, uh, he, he could really start developing himself uh, big time down in uh, NC State if he can keep this up. I was going to mention him as well, but I'll throw the Alabama coach in there. If they can make it to the Final Four or perhaps win the tournament with the style of play that they have, which is an entertaining style to watch at the expense of defense, I think uh, that could be a significant uh, uh, move. Although, it, you know, you, Alabama's already a pretty good program, but you know, where do you go up uh, uh, from there? Maybe maybe uh, you go to an ACC rival, uh, SEC rival next year after uh, John Carroll Perry uh, uh, does not if he does not have success next year at Kentucky. By the way, Tony, yeah. if Tommy Loy, if Arizona makes a run to the Final Four, because um, uh, how, how do you because th Tommy Lloyd's record is amazing, but getting eliminated so early last year was was obviously not good. So they're still alive, but being a West Coast team, Mark's question I think still I, I think. You, you have to bring Lloyd in there because I don't think there's a lot of people on the East Coast who even know who he is still. Yeah, he's definitely not a household name, but I, I think he's he's already won more games than anybody over the first two years. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, the early eliminations in the in the NCAA tournament absolutely hurt him. I mean, they, they didn't make the Sweet 16 last year. I think they might have in, in his first year, but they were high very high seed and, and certainly didn't make the uh, Elite Eight. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the key to uh, to Arizona surviving this season is they brought in two guys with tremendous experience in Johnson who, from San Diego State, who made yep. the, uh, the, the uh, national championship last year. And obviously Love, who played in a national championship at Carolina. So that that could make the difference for that team. Plus, they got rid of Kirk Creesa, the human turnover machine when he transferred to West Virginia. Okay, guys, real quick here before I hand it over to Greg, uh, one other thought just uh, went through my mind, and uh, we'll throw this out there as well. Uh, we've got three teams that are basically playing this weekend with uh, some revenge on their minds. Uh, last year, uh, North Carolina lost to Alabama. Last year, Gonzaga lost to Purdue in the regular season. And obviously, the biggest revenge is San Diego State losing to UConn in the championship game last year. Andy, how big do you feel is revenge at this stage of the season? Is it a factor in this tournament or not? I would think if you're using revenge as a motive in the uh, 
uh, at this stage of the tournament, that's not a good thing. Your goal right now is to uh, – uh, your team should be focused 100% on just winning this next game. And it, revenge can be used sort of as a secondary f factor at this point, but your goal is not to avenge the opponent – uh, that beat you last year. Your goal is to beat the opponent that you're playing today. Uh, the opponent may have a little bit of advantage, although, of course, with roster turnover, as we've seen in the last few years, it's not the same teams that are facing each other, UConn and San Diego State, for example. Uh, UConn has the knowledge that they know they can beat San Diego State because they did it last year. San Diego State has to take a look at it as not revenge, but, hey, this team beat us last year. What changes can we make to take advantage of what they did against us last year. So it, technically it's revenge, but I don't think it's a motivational factor as much as it is, which, which is the traditional thought behind revenge, being motivational, as opposed to being a fundamental challenge as far as, okay, they know us, we know them. What did they exploit last year? What, we, what did we not do well? And if we do that well this year, we can beat this team. Jim, let me ask you this. Then uh, with regard to this, and we'll put the lid on the revenge factor here after this, uh, was there an impact of, of any kind by the odds makers in the number that they put up on Connecticut against San Diego State because of the fact that they handled them quite easily last year in the championship game? Or was that number based largely upon what these teams are doing this year? I think the latter. I think they're, they're, they're looking at the, the number generated things and, and, and they see what they're doing. I don't think revenge really plays much at this level. There's Sweet 16, they're going for a national championship. Hurley's going for to win back to back like like Reed did in football. These are none of these. I don't think any of these teams are looking at revenge as, as a factor. I think they, they have that big prize, something they could do once in their life because college kids move on. It's like like the pros that they can come back. It's uh, it's it's all about that. It's not about revenge. Keeping you know, your Mark, eye on the prize. Yes, Mark, I was going to mention, you talk about the revenge factor, et cetera, and, and other factors and about making lines and what's a, what's influencing the line that's being made. I'll take a look at the game that's going to be played tonight between Seton Hall and UNLV, who both won their, uh, I guess, their round of uh, 16, uh, or round of eight match or whatever it was the other day to uh, make it into this stage. Um, Westgate first opened that line. The game is being played at Seton Hall at their small 1,500-seat gym. Westgate opened the line Monday morning, right after we knew the matchup from Sunday night, with Seton Hall a three-point home favorite. Other books opened it a few hours later, three and a half. It ultimately went up to four and a half by the end of uh, Monday, I believe, or certainly, yeah, by Monday. It went up higher, and I think as we're doing this around midday Pacific time on Wednesday, about four hours before the game's being played, the line was as high as six. Now, my situation there and my question to you guys is, the game is being played not at a neutral site like the NCAA tournament, it's being played at the home court of one of the teams. And not only is it being played at the home court of one of the teams, it's playing, being played on campus at a small gym. The lines maker opened Seton Hall a, what I consider a short three point favorite, basically saying that if this game were played at a neutral site, the game might be a pick 'em. It actually might be UNLV favored slightly because of the fact that when you're playing at home and you're playing in a strongly favoring environment, the home court advantage might be more like four to four and a half, meaning that uh, if this game opened at four and a half, I would consider it, or four, I would consider it a pick em game on a neutral court. Uh, we don't know about UNLV perhaps being the more talented team, and people will say, yeah, they just won at Princeton uh, by a, a decent margin controlling that game, and Princeton gym's not much larger than uh, where they're playing tonight. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on when you see a line like that, especially when it's a home game and it opens with basically a three to four point home favorite being factored in, uh, how you interpret that? We saw the line move certainly right now. The public thought that that was a bad line to the extent that they've bet it up. Whether it turns out to be a bad line or not, we'll find out you know, four or five hours from now. But your approach when you see lines like that, whether it be neutral court or more importantly, home courts, especially in postseason. Well, UNLV has a tremendous disadvantage with the travel that they've had to endure the last couple of games. I mean, East Coast back to West Coast, back to East Coast. That's tough. And as teams playing at home, I think the I think the line came out a little short. Well, there you go. Tony, you think it's a, a short line combined with the fact that uh, there's 
some uh, unnecessary travel here or unusual travel by UNLV? Is that, you think, the reason for this line move? I made it four and a half, five when, uh, when I made my line, and then I saw it open three and a half. So, yeah, I would say it was absolutely short. And uh, as far as moving up to six, I guess most of the tickets are and the money is on uh, on on Seton Hall. So yeah, I, you yeah. know there there is, I guess, uh, a precedent or, or a similar situation for for uh, Big East teams that play at at, at their little practice gyms. Is uh, is uh, St. John's? They play at Carneseca, and they have a decided advantage there over when they play at, at Madison Square Garden. So there's that. But I mean, yeah, UNLV up against it, as Jim said, with, with the travel. Same thing with, uh, with the other game tonight um, as VCU goes to uh, Utah. And that's, that's their first trip into elevation of this whole season. Uh, to, to steer it back to, um, to the NCAA tournament, just it's not necessarily a revenge factor. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot back from both teams in San Diego State, uh, UConn, but there's also a lot gone. Matt Bradley was the leading scorer last year. For San Diego State, he's gone. Like I mentioned, Johnson uh, tra transferred to Arizona, so he's gone from the Aztecs. UConn lost three NBA players, Sonogo and Jordan Hawkins, who's with the Pelicans, and Andre Jackson Jr., who's with the Bucks. So, you know, bo both teams, I, I think, have to look at this particular uh, raw version of their, of their teams. And certainly uh, Dan Hurley has done a fantastic job of retooling, so has Brian Dutcher. Yeah, see, Jim made the point about the travel, and that's why when I pointed out the fact that, yes, UNLV already went out to Princeton and won there, so they were able to. But the key difference here is they went from the East Coast back out to Las Vegas and now back again. Now, it's been about uh, uh, about a week since they week. made that first trip out there. It takes a little bit of, of a getting accustomed. First, you're accustomed from going west to east. You're there for a couple of days. Then you go back out west where you're reacclimating to your normal conditions. And now you're going back east again and having to readjust. So uh, that's why, and I agree, and I mentioned I think before, that I thought that line was a little bit short. And I agreed with what Tony said. What I think Tony said like uh, four and a half about uh, would have been, I thought, an appropriate opening line. And so I think that those who laid four and a half or less probably lay, or took four and a half probably laid or took the correct number. But uh, it, it if you wanted to wait to see what was going to happen. And I think the people who, who wanted to bet the underdog, in this case UNLV, uh, were smart in saying that the public is probably going to bet the favorite up. And here we've seen it go from four and a half as of Monday night all the way up to six in, uh, in um, 48 hours, less than 48 hours. Hey, guys, you're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We're being brought to you by our good friends at uwager.lv, the home of free same-day payouts. Also, monthly 5% rebates are available to all clients at uwager.lv. Check it all out online, uwager.lv, or give them a call toll-free for their Sweet 16 specials this week at 1-800-U-WAGER. And with that, Greg, I'm going to hand this final segment over to you. I know you've got some questions you want to ask of the panel, and I'm sure the panel has some answers for you. Yes, and before we get into the predictions, uh, I, I've, I've got some questions I'm going to pose to the panel here. Uh, and uh, first, uh, we'll start with uh, Tony. Biggest disappointment, Auburn, St. Mary's, or McNeese State? <laughs> you know, I, I won't throw McNeese State under the bus there because that was a really tough matchup for them. I did expect them to show up and win that game, but um, they, they got steamrolled, and they looked like – they were overwhelmed. So I won't say they didn't perform to expectations. Has to be Auburn for me because uh, Yale played well over their heads to win that game. Auburn played down to their level of competition and still that game was there to be had in the final two minutes and they missed bunnies. They missed shots right around the rim in the final few seconds. They had opportunities to at least tie that game and send it to overtime and they just flat out failed. So. Tigers, and, and that's after an SEC tournament title run. So uh, Bruce Pearl has to be disappointed. I saw Katie Johnson already transferred out. So there'll be some uh, some change there at Auburn. We've had a great season. Jim, Auburn, St. Mary's, or McNeese State? Oh, it has to be Auburn. I mean, you you look, look I, I mean, I had McNeese State, and it was embarrassing. But when you, you know, there's Cinderella. They get scared. They get nervous, you know, all kinds of stuff. But Auburn. Auburn was a hell of a team this year. Good coach, uh, tough, tough, you know, tough league. A lot of great competition. 
I was surprised they went down like they did. Andy, I'm going to ask you a different question. Uh, I, I was just going to I was just going to mention one thing about that one, and I thought because uh, I agree with Auburn, but I thought that you, the question that you might have asked along that line, you know, McNeese State, yeah, great numbers, um, but we knew about the level of competition. St. Mary's came from a nice mid-major, but they were playing a darling of everybody in Grand Canyon, who I think that most of the panel, I, I wasn't one of them necessarily, who thought they were going to win. I thought the question you might have asked is which was more disappointing. Auburn or Kentucky? Yeah, well, Kentucky is almost, I mean, it, I don't know. I think what happened was too easy. because <laughs> Oakland. Kentucky's yeah, its own category. Well, that too. <laughs> but because Oakland actually played as well as they did after that game, that made it a little easier. If they would have been blown out by NC State, then, yeah, that would have been, uh, who knows what would have happened. Uh, but I know John Calipari, we all know he's coming back. So, yeah. Um, he's, Oakland, Oakland's campy is a hell of a coach. Yeah, it was nice he to is. see him get this he's, far. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's been, he's been there for a while. Yeah, um, and he's and, and you can tell it by uh, the grays in his hair. Uh, Andy, Go easy there, Greg. Go easy, <laughs> Andy. Most impressed, Clem, and I'm only going to give you the teams that were not one of the top four seeds in each region: Clemson, San Diego State, NC State, or Gonzaga. That's a good question because I certainly say that if I was going to pick one team that came out to mind, it would have been Purdue because of what's happened in the past and how impressive they were. But of those four teams, those are real uh, good ones. I suppose uh, you said Clemson. Who are the other three? San Diego State, State? NC State, yeah. or Gonzaga, the only uh, non-top four seeds remaining. I would have to say North Carolina State uh, because of what they did in winning the ACC tournament. Okay. As I mentioned before, they can do what UConn did about a decade or so ago. And the fact that they carried that momentum over into the tournament. Uh, Clemson is nice, but they beat a, um, a, a more, in my opinion, a flawed New Mexico team and a somewhat flawed uh, Baylor team. Uh, Gonzaga, I guess they were expected to uh, almost make it this far. They beat a an undermanned number four team in Kentucky. That was, I think, a one point game at halftime, and then they blew them out in the second half when you expected the uh, the short handedness of Kentucky, of Kansas to uh, make a factor. North Carolina State uh, had a couple of very nice wins, and I'd have to say that of the four, and you know, again, you can say, well, yeah, take a look at the seeds. You know, they were an 11 seed. Well, maybe they didn't factor, the committee did not factor into account the late season run that got them into the tournament from being not even on the last four in or second four, uh, second uh, set of four uh, that didn't make it. So I'd have to say uh, the uh, North Carolina State team is probably the most surprising of the four compared to what was expected of them by the selection committee and how far they've gotten, especially considering the next highest seed, I think you said, was a number six team in Clemson. And then you'll have to drop down to five five numbers to get to North Carolina State, meaning that they had to beat some nicely higher seeded teams uh, to get there in that second round. Mark, who were you impressed with the most out of those four? Well, you know, I think the obvious would be the highest seed, NC State, or lowest seed, I should say, NC State. But uh, all four teams closed with some momentum. And uh, the one team that uh, I was riding on and counting on, and they've delivered the goods so far, has been Clemson. Sort of come up out of nowhere. I think nobody was really looking at them as being a, a, a horse in this tournament here. I thought they were more like a, a nag in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they've they've exceeded the expectations Clemson has. And, uh, you know, a lot of it here right now going into this weekend is, again, I'm going to harp on that defensive aspect of the game, which they're playing really, really well with right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to bypass NC State and say Clemson because they're a basketball team that I had sort of zeroed in at the beginning of the tournament. Yes. I, I painted them two times, and they have led for all but 31 seconds of this tournament against teams that, them? Yeah, that I expected would beat them. I, I had New Mexico, I had Baylor, and, and, uh, and their best player has averaged 19 minutes a game. Due to nice. Goal. So, I mean, you know, it, it, I, I think it's Clemson too. All right, and uh, by the way, uh, speaking of NC State, that they, they've kept a, a couple of important trends going because a double-digit seed is now advanced to the Sweet 16 in 37 of the last 39 years, and an 11 seed has advanced to the Sweet 16 at least uh, once in uh, nine of the last 10 uh, years. So NC State pulling it for both the double-digit seeds and the 11 seed, and again, the only double digit seed left in the tournament all right it's prediction time 
So uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, Tony. So let's uh, look back. Uh, let's see, Tony, uh, you still have UConn and Houston left from your overall predictions. And right. those are the two teams you had in the championship game, UConn over Houston in the title game. Are you sticking with that? Uh, or, um, you know, or do you have something different? Uh, talk about uh, some of the predictions in these uh, final few games. Yeah, I mean, no need to deviate uh, from that. That's pretty much the only bullets I got left in the holster. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give out some props that I've already written. Um, I, I really like Mike, Michael O'Connell going over four and a half assists uh, in NC State Marquette tomorrow. He's it, What's funny about the NC State run is he had played in like four games four uh, of, of the first 28 games or so for NC State, he played 30 minutes because I guess it, it took Keats a while to warm up to him. He's played 30 or more minutes through this entire run that they've gone undefeated. So that's seven and zero, uh, And he's really done a nice job as a distributor and getting the ball inside Burns and whatnot. Uh, I also like uh, Zach Eady to go under 38 and a half uh, points and rebounds because he's been playing against Smurfs thus far in, in the first two rounds and now he's got to go against Grammy K and uh Watson and all the the taller guys that the Zags have and I think Gonzaga is going to give them a game I also think that's low hanging fruit that uh you know, these these numbers were posted by FanDuel and I wrote a column about it so I'm cheating right now to, that way I don't have to do it off, off the top of my head uh but Edie under 38 and a half points and rebounds and probably my favorite prop Mark Sears over uh 22 and a half points against North Carolina. He's scored in uh, oh, 20 or more points in 16 of 17 games. He's obviously the driving force for Alabama and gets to the line at will. I mean, you get that guy going to, to, to his left. He's unstoppable. He shoots the three well, uh, and uh, he'll have a freshman guarding him almost the entire game. And uh, even though Michigan State got blown out, uh, their their point guard, Tyson Walker, scored 24. I think the year he really gets over 23. So... That'll be my uh, my predictions for props. And as far as a game prediction for uh, this weekend, Sweet 16 games, give me the under in Creighton and Tennessee. I think uh, the balls are, will continue to play great defense. They survived Texas despite shooting horribly from three-point range, horribly from the field for, for that matter. Uh, and uh, I think your only chance to beat Creighton is to uh, try to hold them down. Creighton obviously wants to run, but um, they, they do have a, a shot blocker and call Brenner to slow things down. And they're also prone to some shooting slumps. So give me the under in that game. I think it's in the 144, 140, 144 range, yeah. Before I move on, Tony, uh, the, the teams that are left in the futures, uh, which one of the long shots or, you know, somebody not named, uh, you know, in one or a two seed, uh, which one do you think has the best chance of making noise? You know, we're talking like Duke, Gonzaga, Bama, San Diego State, Creighton, Illinois, those types of teams. I would absolutely look uh, west because, again, no, no, Arizona has a, a geographical advantage, but I think Clemson can beat them. So if Clemson beats them, and uh, I think North Carolina is going down to Alabama. So you, get, you could have a Clemson-Alabama Final Four. So give me Alabama and Clemson futures. All right. I like it. Clemson and Alabama, one of those teams in the Final Four for Tony. All right, Jim. So yes, sir. Tell uh, w w now. Uh, w w let's take a look uh, at what uh, you. Uh, let's see. You had uh, UConn uh, over North Carolina and Houston over uh, that uh, team that just couldn't handle the big stage, McNeese State. So you still have three one seeds, and uh, we talked about maybe we're going to get one of those years. Some strange things happening. Maybe we'll get three number one seeds making it, but. Now that you have one team open uh, from that region where McNeese State was, uh, who is replacing McNeese State for you when we're talking about um, uh, that region, which we have Purdue, Gonzaga, Creighton, and Tennessee? I'm going to go with um, I'm going to go with Creighton. You know, we we picked on the Tennessee coach a few weeks ago. We almost gave him took took all his oxygen away from him based on his past record. So you have you have a painter for Purdue who's failed in the big spotlight a couple times, and we have the same thing with Tennessee. Yeah, will either will either one of them come out of that funk and do something this year? 
Um, a lot of people, of course, are expecting Purdue to make that happen because of the big guy who's very tough to stop. Um, but I'm staying. I'm sticking with Ken, uh, Ken, uh, Connecticut to win this. I, Hurley's done a hell of a job. He knows how to win. He's got the team that can win inside. They can win outside. They play good defense, good offense. They're well coached. They don't get scared. Um, and they're, I mean, they're right there. And I, I don't think this game with San Diego State is going to be close. This is not the same San Diego State as last year. And, can you know, Connecticut knows how to handle that, even though they have different players as well. I just like the, I just like the matchup. It's a double-digit favorite in some spots. It's still nine and a half in a couple other spots. I like Connecticut um, to go all the way. Now, I, as far as the dark horse, I, I really believe that we might get a big upset with this Duke-Houston uh, situation. Um, it, Duke might surprise Houston. I mean, I, I like Samson as a coach, but they're uh, starting to look different. Maybe it's fatigue. Maybe they've uh, talk, been talked about too much all year long, but Duke, Duke is looking awful good to me. Yeah, uh, don't forget, last week, uh, Jim and Mark both had Duke as uh, top future bargains that they would put money on. Uh, and Duke was 35 to 1 last week. They're now down to 22 to 1 this week. All right. Andy, let's take a look. Auburn was the big killer for you. So you still have Alabama, Houston, and Creighton left over. And uh, you need a new champion. So you're just going to replace uh, Houston uh, with, uh, with uh, well, Auburn with Houston since you had Auburn, uh, Houston in the championship game? Or are you going to make some changes now that we're uh, a week later into the uh, into the tournament? Well, I have the winner of Gonzaga-Purdue making it to the championship game and beating UConn. Oh, sort of so a little bit of a, a semi hedge, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that change. Um, in the other two regions, I do think Arizona is vulnerable. As I mentioned before, when we were talking about the, the coaches, uh, was it Oates of Alabama with his style could make a name for himself. Not sure they get by North Carolina, though I'm likely to take the points with um, with Alabama, especially if it goes up a little bit. So I'll go with North Carolina out of that region and down south, replacing Houston. Well, uh, I'm looking at North Carolina State. If they get by uh, Marquette, they have to play Duke, who they beat before, and will be coming off the upset of the number one seed. So that'll I, I will go with Duke for the uh, for the filling out the bracket. But as far as the long shot goes, I will go with uh, NC State at those odds. Yeah, you. Uh, by the way, of course, your top future bargain still left is Gonzaga. Uh, on the show, it was sixty to one, but you had him at what yeah. 120? one twenty. One twenty. And I still think that uh, you know. I'll be taking the points with them against Purdue. But as I say, uh, I, I think I made the comment last week that I wanted three games to see if Purdue could overcome all their demons of recent years. And this would be their third game in the tournament. And so if they beat Gonzaga, I don't believe that Purdue um, under Painter has ever made it to the uh, Elite Eight. I think they're, the best they've done was get eliminated in the uh, Sweet 16. Uh, so that would make another achievement for Purdue. And again, I've been very impressed at the way that they played. And we've talked about it before. Why is this team different than last year? Last year, what they rank in the 300s as far as three-point shooting goes. Now they were number one in the nation. Makes a huge difference. And uh, Edie has, uh, has shown improvement in winning in what will be his second straight uh, MVP. So I like that combination. But if they can get back Gonzaga, if they get past Gonzaga, I think they beat UConn. And if Purdue gets, uh, if Gonzaga gets past Purdue, I think they prevent that back-to-back -back championship. All right, so you basically made uh, wholesale changes. So you're going with Gonzaga, Purdue winner in the Final Four. Uh, you're getting rid of Creighton. You're going with uh, UConn in there. Uh, and uh, uh, you're getting rid of, who was in that uh, one that? Well, that, that I think was, that was the Auburn. That was uh, Auburn, correct. Yeah. And then you're, you're replacing uh, North Carolina instead of Alabama. Right. And you got Duke replacing Houston. All right. Correct. So there you go. That's Andy's updated uh, picks. By the way, who would be – let's get Gonzaga out of the way. Give me a new uh, long shot, futures well, long NC shot. NC State. NC State. State. All right. And what are they right now? 90 to 1. 
still right now. Not bad. You can still get not going again. They, they, they would have to get. They would have to get by a Duke team, most likely a Duke team that will have just upset the number one team. And the, these two teams, Duke and, and NC State, are familiar with each other. Now, if Houston gets past uh, Duke, um, NC State can st has the way that they are playing right now. Assuming that they get by Marquette, which won't be an easy feat, they can beat Houston. Yeah, I, I think the 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 fort Well, I, I think though Marquette is definitely vulnerable considering the teams that NC State has already beaten. So the good thing is, is they don't have to beat these teams. Because even though Marquette's the two seed, I kind of feel, I don't know what you guys feel, but I kind of feel Duke and Houston are better than Marquette at this point. But By, by the way, when I did my analysis of the Sweet 16, both NC State and, and Marquette rank in the bottom four of the 16 teams, which surprised me. I thought Marquette would have ranked higher. All right, Mark, let's take a look. And I mentioned you had Duke uh, as your top bargain team at 35 to 1. They're still left. And uh, you, uh, out of fact, actually, you and uh, you, you, both of us are the only two that has our, our, our predictions last week still up. Uh, you have Arizona over Iowa State and Purdue over Houston. And in the championship, you have Purdue beating Arizona in the title game. So are you making any changes to that, Mark? Well, if uh, I would say that I will roll with what we did, but uh, if asked what I would change, okay, if that's the question, yep, uh, I would look at possibly Clemson to upset Arizona. Uh, then that would give me a Clemson Duke one two combination uh, at some decent prices on both sides of the bracket uh, there that way. I also uh, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but I I. This the week that we see Iowa State taking Connecticut out. I, I don't feel Connecticut's going to repeat. Uh, very, very difficult to do that again. And this Iowa State basketball team is really, really under the radar for a number two seed. Uh, you, th you say number two seed, how can they be under the radar? Well, they just don't get a lot of ink. They don't get a lot of publicity. They don't make a lot of headlines. But all they do is win basketball games. And they do it with great deficient, uh, defensive deficiency. Uh, very, very well-coached team. So... Uh, I've got, I've got in that upset there, Iowa State over Connecticut, and if I have to swap anybody out, uh, I'll swap out Clemson for Arizona to make my Final Four. By the way, Mark, what would you do if the matchup in the regional final is UConn versus Illinois? Uh, I probably won't even watch the game, Andy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Does that mean you think it'd be a blowout? No color. I. Uh, no, I, it just wouldn't have that much appeal to me uh, personally. I'm not a big, big Illinois fan. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, whether it's football, basketball, both combinations of both sports. I thought they were a tad overrated this year. Uh, they go on these runs where in blocks of games where they can win a handful of games by decided margins, and then all of a sudden uh, they go back to the old Illinois ways. But uh, uh, I would be stunned if it was uh, if it was just what you mentioned there, Andy, Illinois and UConn in the final. Uh, that'd be the regional final. Regional, yes. Yeah, and because then, because then it would mean you'd either pick Illinois to end UConn's run, or then you'd then you'd go with UConn's run ending in the final four or the championship game. Uh, well, I've got uh, on my bracket here. Now correct me if I'm wrong. I'm looking at my bracket here. Because I know you said UConn, and I also agree that I do not expect UConn to repeat. I can see it happening, but I don't expect it. Well, I've got uh, Iowa State taking UConn out. Uh, coming up here this weekend, okay? No, that's so, why I posed the question: What if what if Illinois beats Iowa State? Oh, who if they take them out, who, okay. who do you think is most likely to take out UConn if they're not going to repeat? Well, I don't believe it would be Illinois at at that point. I think uh, I think we would give a pass, if you will, to UConn at that particular stage of the uh, of the tournament. But uh, and if I am allowed to use Arizona, I think Arizona is going to take would take either Iowa State or uh, UConn out. But if I'm playing my wild card, my uh, Clemson wild card, I might go so far as to say Clemson might be that team. Every year in the Final Four, we seem to have a team that doesn't look like they belong there. Uh, and that just might be Clemson this year. All right. So that means uh, that would be my last question then for you, Mark, would be a, f a new futures team to add with Duke. Would that be Clemson at 80-1? to 1? Yes, it would. All right. 80-1 to 1, Clemson. 
All righty. So um, I think that's it because, again, you know, usually at this time we, we, we talk a lot about these potential Cinderella's and, and all. And by the way, I don't even do, – do you think NC State, if they get to the Final Four, do you think they're going to be classified as a Cinderella? Yes. Yes. And do you think you they, they should be or do you think they're just going to do it because, have, hey, have, you know, it's marketing. we got to market them. This big guy underneath, this Bur- I think his name is Burns. Yeah, DJ Burns. Oh, he's he is playing. Yeah, he's like a football he, player. I mean, he is very difficult to handle, and he's he's playing great. I mean, his offensive production and the, the assists, and he's he's just playing out of sight, and that is a big reason why they're going where they're going. Um, he continues like that; they're going to be tough. All right, Mark, gotta wrap it up. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, that's going to put the wraps in the show. Next week, we'll come back for our Final Four edition. We'll break down the Final Four teams next weekend, project winners to cut down the nets on Monday. Be sure to tune in, mark that down. You can watch it at Playbook Experts' uh, YouTube channel or playbookexperts.com. For our panelists, our experts on the show, Andy Isco, Jim Feist, Tony Mejia, and Greg De Palma. this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.